Hey everybody, how are you guys doing? This guy was paying a little bit of attention to my leg, so I decided he could say hello. Because he cannot talk. Because he's gonna say hey by just staring at you. Yes. Anywho's it's this is uh, I'm Eric Gerlock, and this is another talk on logic philosophy and a subject that has fascinated me for a very long time. Something I can talk on and on about for a bit, um, the difference between inclusive and exclusive or. When I was in college, one of the things that fascinated me about logic, which I think I took maybe my third or fourth semester, you know, end of freshman, beginning of sophomore year, and I mention is that I did get an A-plus in logic, and that was the only A-plus I got on my transcript, I think. Um, and I think there was a curve, which is the only reason I got it. But logic, formal logic, is basically something like Sudoku. And I knocked it out, you know, not to insult, but Sudoku is a formal mathematical system. And I used the, fourth ma the formal mathematical, not the fourth, but the first most, uh, that I used the mathematical system, I knocked it out, but I've always been wondering, so how do we use logic in the real world? And in many ways, this class is a class on how do we use logic in the real world, and how much is formal logic true or true to life, and then a lot of Wittgenstein. Because I love Wittgenstein, and he says formal logic, which he helped invent, isn't really enough for life. So this is a central subject that I love to show people, and I love to go on and on, and I have for years, about the difference between inclusive and exclusive or. The Taoists say many people rush uh, down the street to get fancy food uh, or fancy things, and they don't pay attention to the simple things on the street every day. If we are uh, getting into the basics of formal logic, and now we are going to start to get into the very basics of formal logic, uh, and flipping cattails here, uh, over there, if that involves formalities or not, that as we get into formal logic and the contrast back and forth between speech in life and pragmatics versus more positivistic formal logic, which is very much a lot of the contrast I continue to draw, the difference between inclusive and exclusive or, which you have been using likely your whole life if you're listening to this lecture, and used or two ways and didn't know you were doing it. Now, it has fascinated me my whole life. You and I use and and or in multiple ways that overlap. Wittgenstein says we're an elastic machine and an or stretch to fit the situation. But the problem Wittgenstein encountered is if I try to set down and and or in one way such that it is a solid mathematical chess move in order to boil down the chess moves of thought, and I have always been pursuing something like psychology and the chess moves of thought via the global history of philosophy. That's very much what I do. I am very open, loud, and proud about that. So in paying attention to things like or, I can go on and on and think about or a lot. And other people, of course, think that's rather stupid and math has been solved or something. But if you are curious how addition actually works in the real world psychologically, you would also be very interested to know how or functions and not, and formal logic goes with inclusive or. That's what Wittgenstein did. We have to pick one. We have to pick one way the knight moves on the board. Even if the knight can move in different directions, the knight just moves in this one configuration. You cannot unbend it or do something weird with the knight move. And that's it. But the problem is, what if we actually in real life use knights in a range of two different ways and we kind of go back and forth? Well, then you don't have square, nice square, man. Night moves, do you? Like the movie I actually like. But, and apparently that was a song, and it's secret moves we make without knowing. Yes, I'll leave that in the politics. So, essentially, if I'm using A or B, and that could mean inclusively, eh, you can have A and B, but then I use it exclusively. I meant A or B, stupid, and I get emotional, as if we don't have more than one here for you to spare, or me, and it's all about me here. Because it's not about you or you, it's about me here. You know, black and white, one way exclusively. You'll notice in human relations there's a lot of inclusive and exclusive stuff. And the ways that human beings are inclusive and exclusive emotionally are the ways, very much in ways, and I will tentatively put uh, dip my toesies in the water outward here, Inclusive and exclusive or may very well be emotional and contextual in just these ways, and I think that's what Wittgenstein and Poe and other people I like are trying to get to. But I'm not going to interweave all that right now. I haven't done Poe and Carol and Wittgenstein yet for this class at all, nor for the modern European class. I'm also going to fit it into. 
So we're going to get into concrete situations of and and or, and this is some of the stuff that I have found magical and amazing about the human mind more than anything. I have been snapping my fingers a lot in lectures and doing simple things in order to show mind. The Zen say all is mind. Examining or in real life shows you mind that is often we're staring through invisible. And that is the sort of thing that fascinates me more than anything. When I was younger, I thought to myself with a jolt, when I was told in formal logic back then, so we're going to choose to use or inclusively here formally, and that's the way it's used. And the first thing is, I didn't even know I was using or in inclusive and exclusive ways in my life. I clearly was. Why am I using the same word in opposite but similar, same but different ways? And why, in order to do formal logic, do we need to limit it to one? That's what this talk is about. Obviously, I am not going to solve everything about that here, but I am going to possibly show you pieces of that that have fascinated me for years and I still use... And I hope I am coming to clearer insights about that and other things. And I hope to do that, again, onward in these lectures for you. So let's first talk about symbolizing things with basic letters, like A and B. So in formal logic, A does not mean horse or turtle. In formal logic, A is a whole complete unit of meaning, what is often called, in words, a sentence, a complete thought. Now, this does get a bit tricky because, of course, in context, I could say the turtle, and that's a complete thought. You know, that thing is what I want you to kick out of the room. Much love to the turtle. Again, it's uh, encased in foam padding, sumo suit. Turtle's totally fine in your imagination, yes? Because I just imagine that. So now the turtle's fine, you know? Wasn't before, now is. Now everything is golden. So... A means something like, the turtle is happy, you know, because none of that just happened. So you're standing on my foot. If I'm like, A, you're standing on my foot, pal. You know, A means you're standing on my foot, not foot, but you're standing on it. So A would be a complete unit of meaning. So if I say A or B in logic, I mean the tree is uh, the tree has flowers on it or the tree does not have flowers on it. That would be A or not A. So, tree has flowers, not tree has flowers. A or not A. If I say A or B, the tree has flowers, or it snowed last night. That would be A, the tree has flowers, B, it snowed last night, and A or B, the tree has flowers, or it snowed last night. This is as basic, you know, as formal logic gets. So, you... You do not represent objects, that's the first point, as letters. You represent whole meanings, and that's tricky because sometimes students screw that up and they start saying, oh, B, the turtle, A, or the turtle. It's like, you know, like, I want ice cream, that's A, or turtle. And it's like, no, 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 or I want a turtle. And you're, you know, cutting out words and simplifying. Keep that in mind. And there's other mistakes like that. I possibly cannot cover the full range of them which is very Wittgenstein, because if this is organic, intertangled with everything, there could be infinite, potentially, variation in hooking up with any other form here. So we won't pursue this entirely, nor could we possibly. But we can assert A. If I say A in formal logic, I am asserting a whole sentence or a unit of meaning. If I say not A, I am denying it. So there is assertion and denial. In formal logic, if they often use P, Q, and R which is proposition and then Q and R don't stand for anything as a full proposition. I use A, B, and C for, I hope, uh, quite obvious feelings that could be described uh, as discrete reasons, although it certainly isn't that in me. Probably you haven't been thinking my thoughts ahead of me. So basically, um, not A, by the way, if you are turning in your logic homework for me, not A, I will accept like minus A, but it is uh, tilde A, which is like the squiggly deal over the N, yay for Spanish, uh, like mañana, tomorrow, and that you have squiggly tilde and then A. That is on the keyboard here. Um, that little squiggly deal is here at the uh, the top, basically right underneath the escape key, you will see if you press shift, you can get the squiggly deal. And that, if you press squiggly deal without space or with space, again, it, it is actually uh, sometimes, well, I'm not the one to format formal logic papers uh, at all, is that you say squiggly and then A, and that is not A. Again, I do love sticking to the basics exactly like this. I'm very fascinated with informal logic. And again, that may sound like secondary, but informal logic would be semantics and meaning and communication in the real world pragmatically, which is clearly secondary for a lot of people. So you uh, hold shift, press the number one, you get the enye. 
and then you follow that with capital A. You can use lowercase abc. In fact, lowercase pqr is typical. I often just use capital ABC. Again, I'm just trying to be simple and consistent. With a lot of this stuff, it is both said be consistent and it's fine. That's what Lewis Carroll says. Then you're also, nowadays, there's actually logic textbooks and there's a bit more. Everyone does it the same. So I could be accused either way of conforming or not too much. So often, formal logic, yes, uses PQR, we use ABC. So we use ABC here, and I use that to understand Aristotle as well as Gotama. Please look at my talks on Indian logic. I am going to parse the chapters uh, on those videos, so it's not just an hour and 45 minutes of me and my face. I don't have to look at that, you know? So I glance at it over here. I don't have to look at that, so that's great. So in the beginning of Wittgenstein's philosophical investigations, he has us imagine two workers building together who belong to a simple culture where one says slab and the other hauls the slab out of the pile to use. Does the word slab mean the object? Wittgenstein asks, or the action? And here, it can kind of mean either, both, and neither. I say slab, and it sort of is the thing, but also the activity. And what Wittgenstein says is, for this simple culture and simple language game, we just invented this out of the ground. This just happens to exist somehow. Who are the mothers and fathers of these people? And where does their language come from? Well, they just yell the word slab and slab dragging happens. So in a certain sense, they don't have the word slab dragging as a phrase and they don't have slab activity as a phrase. That all comes afterwards. So in a certain way, the word kind of stands for everything. And we can see in human language that the word means the activity as well as the object. It kind of means all of that. And then we imagine, Wittgenstein says, if they have specialized practices where, and here I mean different behaviors where they get the object rather than haul it out when they say the word slab, that would allow the process of meaning over time, not necessarily, could happen in different ways in different cultures, but the word slab could then be referring to get me a slab altogether, engage in the activity, and then the word could be used by people easily and freely in pivoting from this to that and interweaving language and in activity words as an element of simple elements uh, like the slab physically and the imagination of what to do with it the goal state all together woven together as slab you know in the practice and then the word slab can become easily two different things as well as the one thing if you see my uh meaning here it can stand for slab the object because we use the word to refer what we already were using branches into different activities where the slab word stays just there and we're not dragging it out. But then other times I could use the word slab to mean drag anything out. And I just call that slabbing, you know, not going to dab nor dabbing. So if it could mean either with no situation telling the difference necessarily yet, but out of the simple cultural situation, it could diverge. And this is how language grows. This is not meaning to call these people smart or, or foolish. This is just to do a simple thought experiment. As Vic This is one of the first major of uh, Wittgenstein's ladder in the philosophical uh, investigations, uh, one of the first in the book, but in his latter work where he's questioning formal logic and how it works in the world, he is trying to show that slab does not have one concrete aha, meaning, but it actually does have, and this is a very simple situation for human tribes and stuff. Notice it's actually kind of civilized. I mock this in my itsy stuff. It is a division of labor. And actually, Bauer says, uh, Brower says, this is, I'm like, I'm feeling class divisions in the use of math and words here, man. And we didn't even use any math. I didn't quantize anything. So we're not even going Brower here or full Marxist, you know, plenty. What we're doing here is we're saying, no, the word slab, which already implies we're building things out of stone. Notice subtly, not everybody builds things out of stone, it seems. But somewhat of Wittgenstein was doing his work in uh, larger Britain. Uh, again, he liked getting out of London and, or, and Cambridge and going elsewhere in Britain, as do a lot of Brits. So uh, he is thinking possibly of Stonehenge even, you know, pulling Stonehenge together. But that also would be by that point, there is specialized divisions of labor, you know. It's nice pants, chief, you know. The, uh, so with all of this, logic, formal and informal, studies how we chain statements together and cats, if we can, hurting them and their footfalls. That's when, uh, we try to chain these statements together. And some of the ways we chain this together, when I was a school kid, a young kid, I watched Schoolhouse Rock. And some of you may remember or see some of that ever. Now we have a deluge of stuff on YouTube for children. 
That saying about conjunction, Junction is a famous song of Schoolhouse Rock, and I totally have the song in my head. I won't sing you about the and button or, you know, it will get you to this point very far, you know, because I still remember it and hear it in my head. So it's a train yard. The connection, connectives and button or can get you really far. Funny enough, I do enjoy pointing to there are 60 words, which I have given as a possible reading for the class. There are about 62 words with and, which anthropologists say are common to all languages. And funny enough, and button or are very common to languages, but actually knife is not one of the words that's common to all languages. Like gather sort of is or put like something like the most basic, of course, of things you can imagine that would be survival in the first words you would use. But actually and button or are not. I want to take a slight divergence here. They're actually not in there. And I was surprised at first because I have actually been building a lot. Now, Wittgenstein says and button or are structural to logic. Now, if those words aren't in the 60 words, the 62 words, that actually does suggest that and button or are not structural to all human thought. But before we say, aha, so logical human beings have and button or, let's stop here and say, I can say A, B, C, assert all of those without saying and. Then I can come up with specialized words like slab, but I start using the word and to mean because I was just adding all those words. I wasn't offering you a choice. Or I could say A, B, C with a tone of voice, and I'm offering you a choice. I want ten I'm putting tension in. But I'm like A, B, and C very calmly. Not always. That's and, 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 and. Calm, not moving. Whether I'm like bad calm. Not moving. And, 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 children. But we don't like that none. Or I'm like, and, 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 children. I mean, I'm a bit tense, but, you know, that's cool. I mean, that's all going to stay right like that. I'm happy about it. But if I say B, B, C, I'm nervous, and I'm actually feeling bad about it. I think we feel all four good, bad, tense, and calm all the time, actually, in different levels. But I'm feeling bad and tense about it, and you're reading my face. It's like... Well, I don't, you know, I mean, do you want or do you want A or B or C? What is it? And then, but if I also say, well, you could have, I could also happy. We're going to Disneyland, kids. We can ride on A or we can ride on B or we can ride on C. Now I'm happily suggesting you do all those things and I'm still tense and offering you a choice, which means things are going to move around. Obviously, I can't say, well, you can have A or you can have B or you can have C, but I could be joking around or acting nonchalant. And it's not that everybody has to be tense while using or. But think about the raising of the voice while asking questions, not in all cultures, but in plenty of cultures to signify things. What we can find is we can actually use and in but. Now, here's another thing. But is not a major connective of formal logic. Why? I have a suggestion why. Not is, but not but. Why? Because they're trying to rule out contradiction. Now, in normal life, we actually have A and also not A plenty, but not a lot of not A. I mean, <laughs> we have plenty of A and then, but there's not A two kids, I'm sad to say. In formal logic, you cannot have contradiction. All contradiction has to work out. So you would have not A, but you would not have but contrary evidence. There are obviously ways of making formal logic fancy enough to handle all kinds of evidence and then jury rig it that way. But this is another hint here. In normal thought, and this is very much formal logic, has to go through motions to make or exclusive. You don't. You just use or different ways. Formal logic has to actually go through extra words to make or exclusive rather than inclusive. And say you're buying a car, not at a buffet, as I'll get to here. We use tones of voice. So that's again, or something like that, such that we could just use or feel it, which is why you've been using or and words like that. I'm going to say and too. In inclusive and exclusive ways, more or less, and you rely on context and can make mistakes. Formal logic is trying to be a perfect language, unlike human logic, which makes mistakes all the time, has overlapping ragged edges, as Wittgenstein says, all the time, such that you get these things correctly with cues, but you could tell jokes or make mistakes. Which is why Wittgenstein says philosophy could be done entirely jokes, and thankfully I don't. But a bit. Yes, some and some, not all or none. But formal logic sort of can't handle butts. And again, even white boys have to shout. Forgive me. I make terrible jokes with this, and I have to shout. That is how I have, you know, no lungs and stand inside with the cats. And yet, I must scream. So... 
Formal logic uses and, or, and but, but those actually don't even exist in primordial human language, but, and not knife, <laughs> not even basket, I think, although knives and baskets come really quickly, you know what I mean, into the scene, with the wham and the bam. So, and, or, and, but are you, words we use a lot. There are a lot of that in, in the Spanglish. There's a whole lot of that in all kinds of languages, children. And yet, that isn't even necessary to language if I actually put words together in ways that imply something that would later be implied, couldn't be implied before you have it, but something like I use words that act as an and gathering, an or dividing of choices, or a but there's contrary against it. Steve said something, but Susan said something against that. And then you let the contradiction hang out, and it doesn't need to work itself perfectly out. Do Susan and Steve need to work themselves perfectly out? No. Are Susan and Steve math? Are they a completeness theory? I don't think so. You know, what's Susan and Steve in uh, completeness theory, Girdle? I don't know. You know, he doesn't even think math gets along. So Susan and Steve don't need to, do they? You know? Yes, or Adam and Steve, you know? Quite, uh, quite possibly. Again, we're being open and inclusive with our ors and our, well, yes. So, because formal logic can't handle conflicting information that suggests opposite perspectives and let all that hang out there together, knowing different kinds of people, nice lady, rather, formal logic evaluates everything in terms of fully true T, there's no lowercase t as partly true, and fully false F. And it disregards how relatively true or false anything is, which is not almost ever like any sentence you ever use in actual life because you almost never would say absolute A, absolute B, therefore absolute C, unless you're making a rhetorical point like you're stupid because we all should have gotten there. And if we don't, then you're pointing out A to B to C to somebody who really is missing a point, and that's part of the context and my tone of voice, and in, 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 certainly. I take full license, you know? I don't even have the right kinds of insurance for this. So, there can't be situations in formal logic where something's somewhat true. Now, we have to deal with situations where something's somewhat true in science and law, and science and law are exactly the place where you'd need anything like formalities in logic and argumentation. So it can't handle something that's plenty a bit false or somewhat true. And here, yes, I know people will say, oh, but there's formal logic systems that jury rig that after the fact out of these clear crystal pieces. But that's the thing. Not all the pieces are crystal clear. That's not the pieces we use because we don't just use capital T and capital F. And so we actually don't just use and, but, and, or, but these words do become common connectives in logic in many languages, and we do have practices, which I would suggest tribally, even if we don't have those, those words necessarily. Across tribes, there's gathering and dividing practices. Mill and pragmatic uh, uh, logicians will say, and I'll get to, and if you didn't add things with your hands and feel about it and divide things with your hands and feel about it, math never would have come into any culture in the world. And that's anthropology. If you want to do platonic metaphysics, sure. But that would be more the side of anthropology than Plato, if you, if you understand the sides here. And I have to stand with anthropology. A bit against idealism. I'm not the mental. I'm not the mental versus the physical, or the physical versus the mental guy, because I like Wittgenstein, and it's not so inside outside divided either for him or for Zen. But things are not just black and white, true and false in the world. That's not what we're simply dealing with. So even if a lot of my logic and, and jokes bug you, I can show you a lot of the moving pieces, and then you can try to drive these horses, you know, around the mountain and one way or the other as you like. It's a bit of the turning of the screw, as it were, you know? It switches back and forth. So, again, if anything's important in life, in fact, you'll also notice it's usually controversial. You know, we have issues with the Brits. So, as for the Anglophonics, we're using the words and, but, and, or a lot, and we're using but a lot, and we're using or inclusively and exclusively. You're going to have to go through a lot of formalities to spell anything like that out in formal logic, even if you can get things and in truth into black and white out of possibility. Now, of course, possibilities are handled in formal logic in ways, but they try to handle possibility in certain black and white terms, of course, because that would be formalities on paper, nice and strict and clear chess moves as best as possible. De Morgan, who was very instrumental in all this, uh, Lewis Carroll had his son build him tiles, uh, help, uh, well, make him tiles with animal characters on them for a fireplace. 
And Lewis Carroll is very aware that his dad was a formal logician trying to work this all into the systems I'm talking about here and or be as formal logic as Lewis Carroll was not sure whether he liked Aristotle or Boole much at all and was trying to go beyond both Aristotle's old time and space passionate logic, White Rabbit, and then trying to get beyond Boole's kind of formalities, which is very much the mad tea party. He's trying to figure out how do I do a bit of Aristotle? How do I do a bit of De Morgan and Boole with formal logic? But how do I avoid what I am perceiving the errors in Aristotle and in Boole? I would say, and that's not hard to find in his writings, that he has those opinions. But then tracing out what he's trying to do with logic and whether he ever did that much to his liking is, of course, a harder task and quite hidden compared to his words where he says much about this. We know that he was studying Lewis Carroll De Morgan as he wrote the works and he was studying Boole and he had all of that. So De Morgan, these are the guys who are first trying to boil logic down to formalities to mathematics, which we are studying and not studying thus in this class in the 1800s in Britain. So De Morgan, which is very recently, how did all these civilizations get along without formal logic? I guess they had math and hopefully art and other things all intertwined. How unmathematical is art typically? De Morgan, who we will study, argued that the moves of formal logic can be boiled down to two, not and or. That actually is still somewhat popular amongst some logicians I hear, but again, I leave that to them. This is slightly incorrect, though. And again, this is controversial. The first move of logic is not a conjunction, uh, but assertion of something like A. Now, he knows that. The first move of logic is not actually, of course, not at or. He knows very much the first move is actually, in a certain sense, he doesn't say it in these words, but he knows. I say A. I assert something. That is, of course, without asserting anything, how the heck do you have anything like formal logic? And then if I say B and I say C, I have, without explicitly vocalizing conjunctions, asserted A, B, and C, whether or not I'm kind of doing it with different tones of voice and I'm asserting it or denying it, let's call a denial an opposite assertion in a sense, loosely here. I'm asserting, asserting, denying these. And that's what you know if I say, if I assert A, B, and C positively or negatively, let's say, and call denial a negative assertion for our purposes, then I'm asserting A, B, and C. And then you have to know and figure out what I'm saying. Am I qualifying one with the other? Am I saying one's not? What am I doing there? That's basic, basic speech and logic, as far as we could boil any act of speech down. And again, in context, flipping somebody off, as Wittgenstein will talk about, actually, he says a rude gesture on the road. Pretty sure that's what that is, or something much like it. Again, want to see my collection of off-color Italian hand gestures? A gesture or a word, stop, is actually a full assertion in context, in a sense, but you don't have to say all of the words. That is sort of debatable, but you get how a simple, you know, not full sentence can be a full thought, in a sense, in context like flipping somebody off, is a bit of a full thought and end state, you know. So, without asserting A, or several things that put A together with them as an and, neither De Morgan's not or or could actually, in a certain sense, get anything done. So there's actually already an implied and here, and then you have or and not. So let's be fair here to and a bit, even if we haven't uh, spoken it out loud yet, as people and cultures. Then, after we have introduced not, we can say things such as A, not B, C. And then, of course, that could mean, depending, did I say A, not B, not C, or did I say A, not B, positive C? Asserting something that contains both assertions and denials. Notice I tell terrible jokes all the time. I would be playing on confusions and ragged edges like that. Yes, I can't help myself. I screw with this stuff. So I will be here Tuesday. I won't be painted blue, and I like kittens. All right, we're good. You know, is this Tuesday already? I have to go. My planet needs me. Formal logic deals exclusively in universals. Again, they have fancy ways of qualifying things after they've dealt in black and white and universals. They very much proceed that way, not from possible possible. And as we'll get, Aristotle says, I'm going to be doing the Aristotle logic lectures soon. Aristotle says some A, some B, some C tells you nothing in conjunction. Now, it does tell you something, some, but it doesn't result in all or none for Aristotle. Therefore, it tells you nothing altogether. Some A, sometimes B, sometimes C. Is that what we're always yeah, dealing with. Formal logic deals in universals, such as all A is B, without any A's being B's, no matter how it B's. In life, what are B's like? Assertions can be universal, but they are also understood in context as local and partial, such as when I tell you A is B, I often don't mean all A is B. I mean this A is B. 
And that, again, formal logic handles it, but sort of then says that's the universe or situation the logic is talking in. Well, what if we jump frame all day long? You know, I mean, a robot could reset logic each situation, but this gets into weird. Why are we formalizing things that need to be reset every single time I use a word and change the context ever so slightly, which I do with my humor, you know, intentionally stretching things. Is you don't know from what I have said alone whether or not I mean it universally, such that every last A is B, or if I meant it is in a restricted sense, such that next Tuesday, this one time only, some of A's will be B's for a bit, and this is exactly humor, because then next week you show up thinking B is entirely great, I'm like, I meant a little bit, Steve, yeesh. If I tell you Steve is perfect right now, do I mean Steve is flawless? you know, diamond Zen mind in all ways? Or do I mean Steve is a perfect choice for a hitman right now? Because in every other conceivable way, I never want to hang out with him. I don't want to meet the guy because he's terrible. I tell you, Steve is perfect as a choice for a hitman. You know what I mean? In context, I don't want to meet the guy. He's only good at that. And then we're going to off him because I never want to meet him. You know what I mean? And I mean, to push a button on a guy, you know, is like for the big boss, you see, capiche for all the semantics here. So, Steve here could be perfect for a moment and then never again. You know what I mean? And that's what the boss told me to do. So I'm not saying anything. You know, it's all applied in context to my tone of voice and accent, you know? And now back to my job as in the critic, as professor of English at NYU's, you know? Because in context, I can use these things and they is perfect. They's perfect. It's beautiful. Humor relies on this all the time, as it is Eeyore, as the source of continuous misunderstandings in daily life and in popular political forums. One side says, we need X. This hasn't happened this week or, or in the last 10 minutes. The other side says, we don't just need X. We can't completely do X. You're doing X entirely. You're suggesting X entirely. That's wrong. Yeah, that's not everything. The first side says, that's not what I meant. The other side says, that's what you said. Say what you mean, mean what you say with Lewis Carroll. Because, and Lewis Carroll loves that phrase, well, why do we have slippages of saying what we mean and mean what we say if we're formal robot logicians? I mean, if formal logic is correct, why do we make mistakes like this all the time? And here you have people have suggested, let's have the er perfect language where we don't make me these mistakes. Would we want it? And is it possible even if we want it? It's a good question here we are not going to get into. I will save the deep uh, gray areas of that for Wittgenstein because that does suggest we never have perfect language and clearly we've never needed it. Why don't we say mure instead of uh, in, uh, just use or? We don't. Why? Like, that's a very good question. Why do we have a confusing word or for different? Why didn't we, many of us, and many languages do have that confusion of or. They don't all need to. There is like ser and estar in Spanish. If I say something is, notice here, do I mean it temporarily in Spanish or the Spanglish sometimes? Yes. Is that I would say, well, esta, you know, it's, it's temporarily es something. Well, esta something. It is, sort of. But then I say es, which means it is. And this actually, I'm going to get in the Mad Tea Party, Aristotle said, well, Aristotle doesn't say in the Mad Tea Party, but in Aristotle's work, he says, there's madness as being angry all the time. And that means you're permanently insane. Like you're mad. You're permanently rude to Alice all day long. But then there's being temporarily rude. And then there's having a personality of being rude often. So being angry permanently is insane for Aristotle. Being angry often is a personality and being angry once is an act okay, or a reflection of, you know, a moment of emotion, whether or not it's active or passive. So that means here, of course, you are mad right now. You're mad in general as a person. You're very, uh, well, yeah, you're a bit of rabbit, you know, and a bit pissy in the Winnie the Pooh characters or and a bit prickly, you know, but not a porcupine or again, you're just permanently angry, which means you are insane. And that is played on, I think, by Lewis Carroll and the Mad Tea Party and the Mad Tea Party time has stopped, which means Boole couldn't tell you, actually, if you're temporarily mad or entirely mad, and that seems to be part of what Lewis Carroll is playing on. I am going to be giving talks on YouTube in a series here, and then I am presenting those to the Lewis Carroll Society in April, actually, and you can look at my work on that. But again, I am dealing with these pieces, trying to figure out Aristotle, Boole, Wittgenstein, and Carroll, and all of this. With Aristotle, Boole, Carroll, A, B, C, unfortunately lends itself very nice, accidentally, meaning that wasn't essential for Aristotle. That wasn't in, uh, designed uh, on purpose. It accidentally, unintentionally happened. The robbers in the countryside for Zen, over here, not over here.
I'm actually doing both though. I can all day long. So humor relies on all of this all the time. I go through weird twists and turns. I then pop right back in. You follow me, hopefully plenty well. Even if you have trouble thinking it, you couldn't. As I'm talking, you have to stop and think for yourself. You are passively soaking this in if you listen to me, and yet your brain is making a lot of the moves I'm making in order to understand me. So in a certain sense, you're passively making moves. I have been thinking recently, if you are passively understanding me right now, are you thinking? It's hard to tell. If you're passively understanding, is that thought? In a certain sense, thought is active mind. Passive mind is soaking it up and making the moves. Is that actually making your own moves, or is that me making the moves, and you're not making them, but understanding them? I don't know. Wittgenstein might say we're not in a position to say. Don't know. Again, always like the joke. Gonzo goes to the phone backstage and the Muppets that's ringing. He picks it up. He says, you don't say, you don't say, you don't say. And Kermit says, who is that? And he says, they didn't say. He's being remarkably inclusive with the pronouns also for uh, old time Muppets. But of course, if he said he or she, he'd have to say a bit, wouldn't he? Humor relies on this all the time, like they didn't say. That's leaving it open. And that wasn't a moment, uh, Muppets was way before the pronoun, you know, uh, practices, uh, as we do now, or, or fail to do occasionally, as I don't. In daily life and political forms, one side says, we need X. I don't because I slip up, not because I'm Jordan Peterson. We need X. The other side says, we don't just need X. And that, again, is very much the magic happens. I did mention in the Hume, you can watch the Hume's talks. I did two of them. I'm going to post the other one today. This is all very Hume and also the Belgian surreal painter Magritte, the surrealist painter, with this is not a pipe, and it's a cartoon pipe. Well, it's an image of a pipe, so it is a, a pipe, and it's not a real pipe, so it's not a pipe. And in a certain sense, A in frame and not A out of frame, and that's what this is not a pipe is playing with. So try to use formal lot Now, a formal, oh, I'm just a robot, pops in and out. Would you appreciate the artwork thus, you know? How can you appreciate the artwork as an open oar hanging there painfully in your face a bit, or it's a buzz and tense, which makes it funny if it's not confusing to you, I don't understand this. Modern artists say, we're not more, uh, Tristan Zara said, we're not more intelligent than you, you're not more intelligent than us, and I'm going to leave this pipe right here, you know? I'm going to let it finish. And then, I, and again, pipe drop. So, yes, it's not a donkey, it's not an image of a donkey, but it is a pipe and not a pipe in two distinct ways, in and out of frame, in a sense. And where are you in the picture, as one for, uh, female naked performance artist once uh, printed about herself a bit akimbo. So when I was a small child, I was told by my progressive parents, I like this funny story, that women can be astronauts. And I do remember ever so slightly, I was excited. I thought astronauts are amazing. And of course, this is Sally Ride was the first woman in space. And people were very much in the early 80s celebrating that, which was when I was a tiny child, that they, uh, we barn, is uh, left the door, leaving the door open though, you know, that they, uh, that Sally rides a woman so women can be astronauts. So I actually embarrassed, the, embarrassed them a little bit to their hilarity when I walked up to a woman or two just, you know, well, like I do now, babbling like a child and or Brooke. And I said, are you an astronaut? You know, to like two women. And they laughed and my parents laughed. I have a vague memory of this and not much. And basically my parents were like, no, women aren't generally astronauts. And of course they said that without saying the word generally, I wouldn't have understood or they did. And then I just slowly understood what the word generally often means. Yes. In context, because confused little me did not understand that if women are, could be astronauts, why the heck couldn't this woman be an astronaut? Of course. And it's a funny childlike mistake, of course, where what they were actually telling me is women can now be astronauts. Of course, I wasn't as progressive as I am now. Yes, but my views on the subject, like uh, Obama's on gay marriage, have evolved. So as I did that, I don't think his did much. I think that's political speech. But that's not important right now. What is important right now, you know, in all that, I lived through the 90s and then the 2000s myself in the evolving of views on gay marriage, etc. Pretty sure Obama's had evolved by then, but much love then most women are not astronauts. So in fact, the likelihood that you walk up to a woman and she is an astronaut is extremely rare. That's because most people are not astronauts. The likelihood any man on the street is an astronaut, even if all men were enforceably astronauts, is extremely rare. So just because my parents were telling me in context, women can be astronauts now, couldn't before. This is exciting. I didn't know that, you know, I'm a small child. 
This is exactly where left-wing culture spoils and poisons the children. Yes, is what I'm seriously telling you here in Berserkly Town. Because, of course, I just made everybody laugh at me as a small child and was a bit embarrassed. I didn't use language none too good, none. Is because, yeah, women likely aren't astronauts. But in context, if you understand anything about progressive politics or related people, yes, is that I do love to make too many jokes. Again, I am a straight dude. So, I have issues. Yes. The, again in the max, everyone has problems with women, which is true, but that's actually terrible. You know, women and men having problems with, everybody has problems with men too, you know. So everybody has problems with women, like this. But they also have problems with men. They just have often specific issues and worries and problems with women. Yeesh, let's keep going. So, and it's usually not astronauts, you know what I mean? They're not the problem. Uh, it's again, I leave them alone. So, Typically. So if I'm going around, I'm asking, are you an astronaut? You're probably not. So women probably aren't astronauts. So that's hilarious because of course, in context, my folks are trying to be all nice and progressive and hippie-ish a bit and be like, whoa, women can be astronauts, man. I mean, whoa, man, you know, from the Mike Myers bit, it's Shrek, which is his dad, Scottish dad, is that, yeah, Women probably aren't astronauts, but they were telling me that women can now be astronauts. I did not understand that. That's more language use stuff, isn't it? And that's hilarious. Of course, it's still funny to me. It wasn't at the time. I was just like weirdly confused, which of course, uh, children being just wide-eyed confused is hilarious, you know, because otherwise it'd just be scary. This is actually the Inuit, supposing, uh, according to anthropology, and one particular anthropologist, I forget, unfortunately, her name was that the Inuit uh, don't ever get angry at children, and they rarely get angry. They just like to screw with children, and they say, oh, well, if you grab pieces of food, the big fingers are going to come out and grab you, kid. And the kids are like, oh, God, and then they actually grow up perfectly fine. And the Inuit famously are like, try to be rarely angry. They see it as very childlike and immature to ever be angry out in a place where you could easily die on the ice flow, you know, or not get enough resources on the snowmobile and not come back. So they don't ever get angry. They just screw with you like heck. You know, I try to imitate, you know, the Inuit. I need to get out there. I'm already out there, but not that a ways. So I like California, you know, I am a white guy. I get cold, you know, so I stay around here where we have acclimated. The, uh, so again, is this all contradictory? Well, yes and no, because again, you can get it. You can laugh and we get it. So how does formal logic handle any of this? Well, it can sort of, and again, formal logic is, the, is telephone systems and computer systems. Formal logic is solidly computer systems. Is formal logic human communication? Partly, you know, at least that's what it's trying to be, and formal logic doesn't claim to represent emotions or motives or funny jokes. It actually claims to represent the base bones of truth itself, but what if that's also the material of jokes and everything? So two of the most important connective conjunctions in talk and logic are and and or. Now, I've already been mentioning a bit of this, and this is now exclusively where we get up to inclusive and exclusive or. Human beings are very inclusive and exclusive with their words. They include and exclude things. One of these things is not like the other. They used to sing to us in Sesame Street. Excuse me. Let's exclude that behavior there and apologize and resume. So we all use all these things all the time. And I was amazed when I was told that actually we use or in inclusive and exclusive ways. I've actually been thinking because uh, Wittgenstein says we use all these things elastically I actually think it can be asserted that we use and clearly, and I'm sure linguists are already on this, um, and I haven't looked up all the right sources, but we use and in various inclusive and exclusive ways too. You can see it in context quite clearly. You just have to, as Wittgenstein says, use many examples. One of the things Wittgenstein says is use concrete examples and use many examples. We're not trying to be rationalists as much as we're trying to be empiricists. We're not trying to be so much Kant. We're trying to be a bit more Hume here. Right? So basically what we're trying to do is if you give many concrete instances of and and or, you can see the ranges we use and and or, and then you don't have to engage in such strict universal formalities. We can use universal formal systems like math. We can understand those tools have their boxes and places and ranges. Some of the range of these things not entirely quantitative thus. And then we also have the rest of the forms of life. And we use or and and in all the forms of life and we use them more rigidly, let's say, and more exclusively in forms like math. That's possibly where math very much comes from and very much where formal logic comes from thus. It's trying to 
squeeze human communication into a narrow, formal, rigid frame, rigid designation, designated and, and so discreetly, too. It's quite polite and uh, not for everyone uh, because the body, unfortunately, in the common gets into all of this, like my jokes. We use or in opposite ways comfortably. We don't notice we do it. That has continuously blown my mind, changed my mind. You know, do I put a gun on my desk between you and I? I don't need to be so exclusive, do I? No, you know, your mind won't allow me to. So let's say I take you to a buffet for lunch and I tell you, you could have eggs or salad or pizza. It's like I used to go to Fresh Choice back in the day with family. I don't even know if that's still alive. And we would just hit the thing, you know, try to deforest the salad bar. So you go get some eggs. I used to row, row on a lake back in the day. And then you hit fresh choice with everybody. And they're like, oh, God, you know, oh, Lord, they're coming. So you get eggs. Now, if you come back to the table all happy, you know, with eggs, salad, and pizza, and I'm like, whoa, 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 jerk. You know, I told you eggs or pizza or steak. What's with the eggs and pizza and steak? I, a long time ago, actually, I had a fresh choice. I got eggs and I dumped what I thought was cheddar cheese all over it. And then I took a big bite and realized that was shredded carrots, you know. I actually did eat the eggs. I didn't eat the carrots. I scraped them off, you know, and I went back for the cheese. But yeah, that was not, uh, that wasn't an inclusive or that I'd like to include in my uh, qualified better statements here, I assert to this Senate committee. <coughs> I cough discreetly. So we separate that out of the testimony. You, you ingrate, you know, how dare you get A and B and C? I didn't say A and B and C. Because when you actually, now here's the elasticity, I could have said, and think about how amazing this is, in context, I can tell one kid, you could have A and B and C, and they go in freely at a buffet, understanding buffets, having seen them before, why am I telling you this then? They go and get A or B or C as they like. I then tell another kid, you can have A or B or C, and I mean exactly the same thing. Now, how can I mean the same thing effectively if I'm using and and, and, and then the other one, or, or, or. And the thing is, is that when we use and very inclusively, which and is already inclusive and not exclusively, like if you don't have exactly these things and all of them, I said A and B and C. Here you are coming without all of them, kid. I told you very exclusively to get me A and B and C at the salad bar. I thought you meant I could make my own salad. I am sorry, man. I'll show myself out. But that's not like buying a car. If I walk into a car lot with you and I say you can have A or B or C, or if I say you could have A and B and C, you understand resources are scarce. You understand I'm going to get upset at you if you choose A and B. And I'm like, I didn't say that. Now even, and I love to twist this around, what happens if we're going on safari? We're going on safari in, uh, you know, Antarctica. I don't know, you know, in the jungle there. So we're going to go get a bunch of cars. And I say, OK, we really only have budget. I mean, the budget's, you know, kind of we've talked about how the budget in context is stretchable. We've actually had to say we can only afford one step ladder. Well, let's have two. I don't know. So then we go to the Honda dealership and I'm like, OK, you can have one or the other or the other, you know, with that with the rooftop rack tent. And then it's like, you know what? We actually have enough. I did say that, but you know what? I'll allow it. I will allow it again. Uh, I forget the comedian's name. Uh, she's awesome. But uh, that in there, it's like, well, what happens when I use and and or in all these ways confusingly? Now, is the formal logician correct here if they assert that we've been using language incorrectly? I'm sorry, no. And here again, if it's like, but we really need to use language formally to use it correctly, find the frequency analysis that shows you that logic and language here is used more formally than this. Of course, it's the robbers in the countryside right here. Actually, the robbers in the countryside are going to have their way with the emperor, unfortunately. Yes, let's pass along and exclude all that from our minds. We don't imagine anything. So, effectively... You can have a Ford or a Subaru or a Toyota. You're like, yeah, I'll have all three. That's good. We have the budget for it. Well, of course, I could be easily in context, and this is the jokes here. These are the jokes. You can line them up in jokes you already like, that you've already heard these ways, which means your mind already understands and an or in context. That you understand all of this. Now, what is all of this I'm confusingly telling you saying? We're getting upon the 50-minute mark, so I'm going to close this out here clearly in the hour. Now, what is all of this saying? And what Wittgenstein suggests, 
What this actually is suggesting is you don't go through formal moves to use and and or. You just use the word and what's supplying the formality. I do believe it's largely how we feel in context with others. I think people have been excluding basic emotions. And when we look at with Poe, that is card players were reading people to see good, tense, bad, and calm overlapping in ways to see what their cards are doing. I think good means we're attracted to things. Bad means we're repulsed from things. Tense means something's going to change. And calm means something isn't changing. Poe doesn't actually say that, but it's very implied. I mean, he just casually says those four things. I don't think he's trying to make a whole psychology. But I am using and picking up those four from Poe. And I would say something like those four, as well as any other feelings, let's not talk about, that creep in here. But those feelings also are powered very much by good, bad, tense, and calm would determine how you hear and and or, and those aren't formalities here. Now, formal logic can try to represent those formally. There's no reason they can't, nor we can, and we can invent computer characters that perform emotions a la Turing tests. You know, we can do this, but the thing is, is you're not a computer program and you aren't doing all this in language. You are doing it with emotions intertwined with words, intertwined with physical objects like cars or things at the buffet, and what you imagine is going to be on your plate or your car in the safari. So we use perception, imagination, memory, that words and emotions all of that and i am asserting and i do like asserting here that's how we use and and or these ways that is what i am asserting here and formal logic if it x's out emotion and tries to hold all this formally is actually according to poe and then lewis carroll formal logic would and mathematicians are ignoring this situation and much of formal logic and analytic thought still is not going human enough is what wittgenstein might say and he said that before he died in 1950 or 51 Let's be inclusive here. Uh, for me, I mean, you know, we're being allowing for my uh, lousy scholarship, you know, because I always say it's either 50 or 51. Doesn't really matter. Does reflect poorly on me, doesn't it? Makes you feel all kinds of things. And here come the jokes. So in formal logic, we only have one symbol. That's always you are taught. And this is what blew my mind. Now, wait a minute. And this talk and a lot of this stuff comes from that in me, between me or you and me. So... And I rely in telling a lot of jokes that you understand and follow along, even if it sounds funny. Am I planning out all the ways you're going to feel the joke? No, I'm just putting it there and you feel about it. And so do I with simple words. I'm doing that on purpose, even if it is annoying. And Wittgenstein said to teach philosophy with, or at least, you know, at least with possibly entirely yeesh jokes. We could have a nyor symbol. There are, and somebody will step up here and say there are formal logics with nyors. That's right. But what about in the case where I'm using it kind of both ways and you don't know? Now, let me say here, and again, uh, read up on the notes. We do, a, a, I use a lowercase v, and that is imperfect, but I use that between things like a and b and p and q for or, and we use that always inclusively in logic. And we use an upside down lowercase v, which is very much pressing shift and then the six key. I will show here between things for and. And I, there are different symbols. I then use this same symbol pointing one way for if then, because I like using the same symbol consistently. Again, I take license to use symbols consistently like Lewis Carroll says we should. And those symbols are often formalized slightly differently. My apologies. But again, I am doing actually what's easy for the students to type on their keyboards, rather social context and logic for everybody, kids, rather than formal logic symbols you cannot find easily on your keyboard, which wouldn't make formal logic commonly accessible to people, you know? It's hard for people to type formal logic assignments if they don't even have the dang symbols on the keyboard. Uh, they have them somewhere in the dingbats, I believe. But then there's the 90s before your time children if i send you to the store to get all kinds of fruits and vegetables for a salad get a and b and c you come out back with nine of ten i might have been using and absolutely and with computer programs when i use and i mean every last thing in formal logic in formal logic and this is jokes on logicians if you go to the store and you don't get c or q and you come back you are entirely wrong you aren't nine tenths right you are false wrong if i say a and b and c and d and d isn't it isn't three quarters correct it is entirely false because formal logic does not have symbols in basic formal logic you do not start with three quarters false ever that would be other mechanisms or logics and other things you always start with simply completely true and simply completely false in all contexts, unlike almost anything ever important to any human being ever. 
because almost all language would only be saying contextual things because why would you ever have to make moves universally? It would already be the situation. And probably everyone would know it, so they'd automate it with telephone systems or computer systems and or ignore it and go about their day and pay attention to meaningful possibilities, which would be 9 out of 10 rather than fully true or false. That, unfortunately, is still my frustrations, if you can read the tone in my voice, about we're really not teaching logic to do anything other than we're not helping people argue, you may have noticed, and formal logic doesn't. It does gear up sellable computer systems and telephone systems to people. It does give you black and white machines that operate with switches. May not so much for fractal computers of the future. But as far as uh, informal, actual thus, argument in the world, which we still have for some reason, in spite of all the math and computers, almost as much as Sumer even, which do we, you know, are we more or less argumentative than the Sumerians? Feel it out, man. I mean, use, uh, I don't know, finger painting rather than math here. Be real loose about it. You know, I mean, be unscientific and anthropological about it. You know, put yourself in another's place. Feel, you know, with J for Jane Goodall. You know what I mean? And then we'll get somewhere, right? Anyway, again, groping towards the interests of women. So informal logic, and unlike or, is used exclusively. I am being assaultive in language. My apologies. I'm mocking political situations without mentioning them. Such that if you get 99 out of 100 things right again, eh, wrong Usually in life, if you get 99 out of 100, that is a win, not an absolute fail. But then again, that's not formal logic in its simplest basic forms, and that does affect all of that thus. If you're thinking in those frames already and then backforming possibility into things and exclusive or. Notice actually if, if exclusive or, it's like inclusive or is more basic, then why not just ands of various, you know, types? Why an or at all? Because you'd have to, and then why the need for nyor over on the other side, past and, you know, way opposite and? That's weird. The reason is because you have an absolute not. So anything negative is not handled by or in logic, in formal logic with and, or, and not. But unfortunately, we use or both ways. That's confusing. Should we become more formal? I haven't more than one student suggest we do. I don't think we can. Or rather, if we did, what happens if things continue to shift around and we're as much as the Sumerians? Formal logic may not have had much use for but and less use for nor, but some claim that in English there is a simple set of basic conjunctions. And, or, nor, for, so, but, and yet. I don't know if these make perfect sense, but again, in natural semantic metalanguage theory, I already mentioned one among base, three basic dominant theories, apparently, argues there are 65, there's the number, not 60, not 62, I am being quantitative occasionally, words and occasionally correct, precisely thus, don't have to be always, as mentioned. If Daniel Everett is right that the Pitaha tribe of the Amazon, the words one and two can be crossed off the list, though. So some of the 65, 63 of these, besides you, I, thing, body, kind, part, this, same, other, good, bad, big, small, think, no, want, feel, see, hear, touch, say, true, do, move, be, life, die, time, before, after, long, short, now, where, here, far, near, inside, outside, very more, like, and way, man, the Tao. Because there's a way of this and a way of that. And actually, if there was just one way, well, then you'd never need the word way this, way that. There would just be the way, man, way out there. And no one would ever use the word way in particular in context, nor need to. It's perspective, you know? It's kind of cosmic. Are the logical connectives, in a sense of language, not if and... That's not if, because, maybe, and can are somewhat in there, with or and and interwoven in the last few in ways that don't have to do, if you think of not if, because, maybe, and can are on the list, that is kind of and and or a bit. But again, weirdly, we don't hit that list with anthropology, or at least that's one of the three theories, and say, let's get formal logic upward from that. Of course, I do think formal logic is late 1800s. These theories are more recent in language. Maybe formal logic should be entirely... Uh, reevaluated. I don't know, you know, because it kind of sits in departments and it's useful for computers. And then how much do the science departments ever talk to formal logic at all to get any insights here? They seem to be more into pragmatism, honestly, and that's been sidelined by philosophy departments for at least the last hundred years. 
So notice that and and or are not the words on the 65 list explicitly. All As mentioned with De Morgan, we don't actually need to say and, and if we just keep saying things like a, b, c, maybe, and can are very much like ors, as saying maybe a, maybe b, or a, b, can, is much like saying a or b, considering possible operations and ways. There are ways of a and b. Skeptical thought versus objective uh, dogmatic thought, which is very much what we're screwing with, Ancient skepticism, I tell people they often look at other animals, they often look at other cultures in ancient India, Greece, and China and say people have different ways. Now, even if you stuck with one culture, saw no animals ever other than humanity, the animal, again, the huge manatee, is that, uh, getting huger, you know, by the season, is that, well, you know, you do and don't have to use these words in these ways. And exclusive or and and exclusive and in a sense are used in distinct opposition to each other even and then other forms of them there can be no cases in which we are saying you can only have one but not others but you can have but you have to have them all entirely forever that doesn't make any sense we can think of imaginary science fiction stories like that but that would almost rarely ever happen in real life you do something once now you never 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 have to do it again for anyone else or in any other situation and it is entirely. That's just, again, for mortal beings. Yes, we even come up with, you know, all sorts of permanent things. We believe in permanent things like math, all sorts of things. But in a certain sense, we, you know, go keep going through motions also, is what the skeptic would say. Isn't it odd that such basic connectives, words that sound the same indistinguishably, indistinguishably either way, are used in ways that are inclusively interchangeable, but also not exclusively, uh, also not exclusively or interchangeable? Hey, buddy. We have a cat. Yes. He's right there. It's it's me or the cats, really. But hopefully that's inclusive. You know, in my purposes, wheelings and dealings. So if you're in the logic class, please uh, check out the second assignment. Um, people have already sent me the first one a bit. Uh, please send those in. Again, you can work at your own pace. Turn it in by the end of the class. I will get to the grading. I'm trying to get the videos up. Um, I am going to have you guys, uh, most of the assignment is try to work out your own examples of inclusive and exclusive, or please don't use the buffet again and the car. Please try to think of very simple examples you can use. And again, for the assignments, try to be, unlike me, as slow and careful as possible. Talk things out as simply as you can, which hopefully I am doing quite quickly, quick enough. Talk things out slowly and don't get too complicated. Allow yourself the patience and time to work on the basic issues of thought and speech. And don't rush to some fancy example. People always do that in logic. A and B and C or D. No, 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 no. I said A or B. Just give me a real puppies or green things. You know, something really easy. Seriously, stick to the easiest things. Again, you will overthink it. Don't try to be fancy. I will be more impressed if you be as dumb and simple as possible here. Then if you try to fancy it and immediately nosediving into the ground like the proverbial head of the ostrich, yes? So much happiness and or sadness all throughout your life, inclusively and exclusively. Much love and happiness, again, in logic and lack thereof it and finger painting for you and your folks and your kind and tribes. And I will see you and or if you are the set of people that I do and don't ever see. <laughs>